Good morning. This paper was initially born out of the belief that the literary work of Kazantzakis can be assessed and illuminated using other artistic mediums, particularly music. This musical approach has been fruitful for other authors. We have seen many scholars discuss the sonata form of Chekhov's work, for example, particularly in his short story, The Black Monk. Chekhov, according to the great Russian composer Dmitry Shostakovich, was, quote, a very musical writer, but not in the sense that he wrote alliteratively. Chekhov is musical in a deeper sense. He constructed his work the way that musical works are constructed. Shostakovich's insight into Chekhov's artistic technique clearly offers a new perspective to his stories and prose. Can we say something similar about Kazantzakis? As John Papayanin notes in his article, Kazantzakis and Music, there is clearly a musical appeal to Kazantzakis' work used by many composers, Greek and foreign, either as incidental music, i.e. as accompaniment to his plays or novels adapted for theatre, or more autonomous music that is based on his texts and ideas. This musical quality was also evidently seen by the Czech composer Boroslav Martinu in the development of his opera, The Greek Passion, premiered in 1999 in the Royal Opera House in London under the direction of David Pountney. What music did Kazantzakis himself like? We know from his own correspondence and from Papayano's article that he adored Bach Mozart and Monteverdi, disliked Wagner and Debussy, and was comfortable discussing the revolutionary merits of Tchaikovsky symphonies with his predominantly Jewish circular friends whilst in Berlin in the early 1920s. In this admittedly experimental paper, however, I wish to look at parallels between Kazantzakis' spiritual exercises, as EDP, and a seminal symphonic work composed at the end of the 19th century, the Third Symphony of Gustav Mahler. I am, it must be clearly stated at the outset, neither a musician nor a musicologist, but I do hope that it may provoke some food for thought for those more musically qualified than myself. Let us begin, therefore, with Kazantzakis' arrival in Vienna, from where he first started composing SQTP. When Kazantzakis arrived in Vienna on the 19th of May 1922, he arrived in a city in great economic turmoil. Life here is becoming continually more fierce, he writes in a letter dated June 11th, 1922. Everything has doubled in price in two days because the crown fell. When I came here, the English pound was 41,000 crowns. Today, it's 72,000. And it keeps going up. It's impossible for the local people to live. End quote. He then proceeds to declare the crucial role of art in such anxious times. Quote, oh, if only we could find such words to keep our anguish from dying, our soul from expiring from the wretched body. Shortly afterwards, in early August, Kazantzakis wrote to Galatia, informing her that he had started sketching the skeleton of a new work that was to be purely theological. It was, of course, his Askitiki, Spiritual Exercises, a work finally completed in Berlin in April 1923, with the additional ending, Silence, provided from Siberia in 1928. As we know, Askitiki takes the reader on a progressive evolutionary journey, influenced by many factors, including Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, Freud, Buddhism, left-wing political activism, but ultimately by the philosophy of his previous teacher, Henri Bergson. In a letter from Berlin, dated the 28th of December 1922, he wrote to Reverend Papa Stefanou, quote, I am composing Eskitiki now, a mystical book in which I describe the method by which the soul ascends from circle to circle. There are five circles, self, humanity, earth, universe, God, until it reaches the supreme touch, the method by which we may ascend, and all, ascend all these steps and, when we reach the highest, may experience all the previous ones. End quote. Much has already been written about the meaning of Askitiki and its theological significance, or lack thereof, and obviously I cannot go into much depth at all in this very short paper. Much has already been written also about Bergson in terms of his influence on Kazantzakis and his notion of the Elan Vital, the life force that wills itself into existence and has progressed through plant 
and animal evolution in seeking the best route to achieve self-consciousness will already be familiar to many. In essence, SBTP commences with a preparation for a Bergsonian march, which, as Kazantzakis himself describes in the aforementioned letter to Papa Stephanou, takes the reader on an initial five-step journey, increased to six with the later edition of Silence, through ego, race, mankind, and the earth, before exploring more specifically mankind's relation with God. His aphoristic style captures this evolutionary journey. Quote, which is the one force amid all of God's forces which man is able to grant? Only this. We discern a crimson line on this earth, a red, blood-splattered line which ascends, struggling, from matter to plants, from plants to animals, from animals to man. This indestructible pre-human rhythm is the only visible journey of the invisible on this earth. Plants, animals and men are the steps which God creates on which to tread and to mount upwards." End quote. This is, of course, Pierre Bergson. It is important, though, that we recognise that the work should be read as belonging to a wider religious tradition that championed the priority of the will, <coughs> even within God, as the driving force behind evolution. I have argued elsewhere that this philosophy of the will, and chiefly the unmaking of materiality, in order to allow the creative life force, which Bergson and Kazantzakis both termed God, can be seen to have its roots stretching back through the romantic thought of the later Schelling, the mystical thought of Jacob Burma, and ultimately to the pre-Christian, neo-Platonic thought of Plotinus, whose maxim, remove everything, Kazantzakis quotes in a letter to Galatia from Berlin in November 22, whilst composing SVTP. <coughs> The thought of Burma incorporated many of the ideas of Plotinus into a Christian framework. Even Schopenhauer, so often seen as purely pessimistic, recommends the work of Plotinus and Burma as examples of positive mysticism, while developing his idea of the world as will and re representation, an idea which clearly influenced Kazantzakis. Burma's emphasis is on the whole of created reality as a manifestation of the divine will, a self-evolution and self-realisation of the consciousness and personality of God. Burma thus has a central place for novel creativity and becoming within the Godhead, emerging from the pre-ontological freedom <coughs> of what he calls the Ungru, or non-material abyss. This is essentially the same notion of God that we see in the philosophy of Bergson. Indeed, Burma's emphasis on the idea of chaos, strife and polarity as well as the emotions of will and desire within God, emerge in a similar fashion with Bergson, who posits a primal, indeterminate and inexhaustible source to all life, from which emerges a desire for self-conscious awareness and a required need for creation. The concluding abyss of Kazantzakis' SVTP, so often interpreted as purely nihilistic and negative, may therefore be seen and clearly is so in his later work, The Odyssey, to be the womb of spirituality required for the life force to manifest itself once more <coughs> within the material world. This is an evolutionary program, ending with a non-material silence, which may also be seen in Mahler's Third Symphony, to which we now turn. <coughs> Mahler began composing and conceiving his Third Symphony around 1893, and in 1896 settled for a two-part, sixth movement structure with the following programme. Part one, Pan awakes, summer is marching in. Two, what the flowers in the meadow tell me. Three, what the animals of the forest tell me. Four, what humanity tells me. <coughs> Five, what the angels tell me. Six, what love tells me. The symphony captures almost many of Mahler's pervading influences of the time, not least his interest in German Romanticism, Schopenhauer, and particularly Nietzsche, whom of course he came to later reject, but whose thus spoke Zarathustra was deeply occupying him during his initial composition of the symphony. The Nietzschean influence is very explicit, with the fourth movement set in the words of Zarathustra's midnight song in a solo alto setting. We also know that Mahler had considered some 
subtitled in the symphony, The Joyful Silence, echoing the title of Nietzsche's 1882 work, and many have suggested a Dionysian, Dionysian exuberance and intoxication to the work that makes it clearly Mahler's most Nietzschean. This Nietzschean influence is clearly evident and obvious, yet it would be a mistake to focus purely on the fourth movement to come to this conclusion. In keeping with his own theology, Mahler's symphony is a totality, with each individual movement subsumed beneath the greater whole, and must be understood, <coughs> interpreted, and ultimately conducted with this totality in mind. While much has rightly been written on the Nietzschean influence behind the symphony, therefore, less, less has been written on the similarities with Bergson. Nevertheless, as early as 1918, the influential Russian musicologist, Boris Asapiev, was comparing the musical texture of composers such as Brahms, Bruckner, and especially Mahler to the demonstrations of organic life in terms of Bergson's philosophical ideas. More recently, the very eminent Mahler scholar Donald Mitchell also drew parallels between Bergson and Mahler. Let us therefore very briefly look more closely at the symphony itself, drawing on Mahler's own programmatic descriptions of the six movements. In the initial prelude, in which Pan awakes and Summer marches in, inorganic matter is summoned into life by a piercing trombone solo entrance, signifying the god Pan and the emergence of Summer. From there, Mahler proceeds to develop an evolutionary system that commences its journey, more specifically its march, from plant and vegetable life to animal and human life, finally to angelic and spiritual life. The open, opening military-style marching theme dominates the first movement from start to finish and can be seen as a clash between stasis and inertia, symbolised by winter, and the fruitfulness and growth of the summer march. As Mahler puts it, the battle begins. Kazan Zakas, as we know, also commences his spiritual exercises with the dynamic battle of opposing forces. Quote, A, the ascent towards composition, towards life, towards immortality, B, the, de the descent towards decomposition, toward matter, towards death. <coughs> As Mitchell writes on this first movement of the symphony, quote, it is always a problem to find the right words or terms in which to describe music as idiosyncratic as this huge march for a very large orchestra. Perhaps if we respond to it as an expression of the life force, Henri Bergson's Ilan Vital, the creative urge at the heart of evolution which carries all before it, we come near to what Mahler consciously, or more probably unconsciously, had in mind, end quote. Katanzakis, of course, quite consciously uses this. In his second movement, the minuet, Mahler himself wrote, dismayed that the movement was often performed on its own, independent of the symphony as a whole, quote, it always strikes me as odd that most people, when they speak of nature, think only of flowers, little birds, and woodsy smells. No one knows the god Dionysus, the great Pan. There now, you have a sort of program, that is, a sample of how I make music. Everywhere and always, it is only the voice of nature. Now it is the world, no uh, nature in its totality, which is, so to speak, awakened from fathomless silence, that it may ring and resound." End quote. This idea of nature as a totality and the inextricable, inextricable link between all components of the evolutionary struggle also resonates to rescue the key. The third movement, What the Animals of the Forest Tell Me, a scherzo, quotes extensively from one of Mahler's early songs. The movement has been described by Theodore Adorno as being prompted by animal symbolism and having a fairy tale tone, quote, as a fearful child identifies with the tiniest goat that escapes the big bad wolf, end quote. Through animals, Adorno continues, humanity becomes aware of itself as impeded nature, and for this reason, Mahler meditates on them, end quote. We have already noted that Mahler sets the words of Nietzsche's Midnight Song in the fourth <coughs> movement, What Humanity Tells Me. The following fifth movement, What the Angels Tell Me, includes another early song of Mahler, Three Angels Sing a Sweet Song, based on the 17th century church hymn, which includes a female choir and a female chorus and a boy choir, 
Following these two lyrical movements, words are silent, and the great symphony concludes with a beautiful adagio, what love tells me. Of the great finale, Mahler's contemporary, Bruno Walter, wrote, quote, in the last movement, words are stilled. For what language can utter heavenly love more powerfully and forcefully than music itself? End quote. With this concluding adagio, the balance of the symphony is restored from the various conflicts and contrasts of the previous movements, and Mahler's narrative is complete. This non-lyrical, non-material silence, much like the ending of Kazantzakis' Askiti Ki, is thus the positive conclusion and summation and apotheosis of all that has gone before, and rather than the final point of annihilation, is actually a womb for further creativity. As Kazantzakis himself writes, Quote, silence means every person, after completing his service in all labours, reaches finally the highest summit of endeavour, beyond every labour, where he no longer struggles or shouts, where he ripens fully in silence, indestructibly, eternally, with the entire universe. There he merges with the abyss and nestles within it like the seed of man in the womb of a woman. What can we conclude from this all too brief exploration? We know from a lesser Kazantzakis sent to Galatia in Berlin that he spent much of his time there writing, reading, and listening to music. We know further that whilst in Vienna and Berlin, he listened to a considerable amount of Brahms and Mahler. Can we therefore declare that Kazantzakis' Askitiki was directly influenced by Mahler's Third Symphony? No, I don't think we can. It is hardly surprising that Kazantzakis was listening to Brahms and Mahler as these were the two composers most on vogue at the time. He may have had very little choice. Furthermore, even if Kazantzakis had attended the performance of the symphony during his time in Vienna and Berlin, he would not have been aware of the specific programme. Mahler had largely requested the removal of all programmatic titles of his symphonic movements by 1898, although he did allow them to be included in a 1906 performance. What we can conclude, however, is that there is a clear family resemblance between the philosophy, more specifically the theology, of these two pieces of art. Mahler's symphony, like Eskiti Key, expresses an evolutionary scheme in which the conflicting forces of life and existence clash, yet ultimately ascend, more specifically march, through inorganic matter, animals, to humanity's relation with God, synthesizing in a non-material finale or coda. Even if, even if Asfiti Key has a more explicitly political agenda than Mahler's State Symphony, this is not to say at all that the symphony was politically neutral or inert. Indeed, the political component to Mahler's symphony is increasing, increasingly recognized, with the claim, which was voiced initially by <coughs> Richard Strauss, amongst others, that Mahler's use of a melee folk tune in the first movement is a veiled call to arms to the working class. We also know that Mahler voted socialist in the 1901 elections. Nevertheless, we know that from both artists' programs that they saw their respective works as largely <coughs> theological in outlook, and that any political leanings for Kazantzakis were always in the service of the overall spiritual life, the saving of God. It is my belief, writes Donald Mitchell, that Mahler's Third Symphony is to represents the first attempt to use music to enact the evolutionary history of mankind. Mitchell continues, quote, It had always, always seemed to me, seemed very probable to me, and I think to many others, that in conceiving the third, Mahler was influenced by the current evolutionary theories of his time. We often find the name of the French evolutionary philosopher Henri Bergson mentioned in this context. I have often done so myself, though in fact his most famous theory, that of the life force of Alain Vital, was not launched until well after the third was completed. Nonetheless, it has always seemed safe to me to assume that, giving Mahler's inquiring mind, he had been intrigued by the then current post-Darwinian thinking. I was particularly interested, therefore, to be made acquainted with an evolutionary scheme that long preceded Bergson or Mahler, but most remarkably anticipates the sequence that Mahler finally, finally came to adopt, end quote. 
This is indeed both fascinating yet unsurprising because, as I've mentioned above, Bergson was himself drawing on ideas of Plotinus <coughs> that were assimilated in the Christian mystical thought of Jacob Burma and the later thought of Shelley. This evolutionary scheme of God is, I believe, a very productive way to understand not only Marvel's Third Symphony, but also much of the underlying philosophy of Asketiki and indeed Kazantzakis' philosophy of death in the Odyssey. Kazantzakis commenced writing Asketiki at a time of great economic anxiety, yet he continued to believe in the power of art to inspire and drive humanity and God forward. He was particularly troubled also by the current political situation in his homeland. From Berlin, Berlin in 1922, Kazantzakis wrote to Galatia, quote, Comrade, I'm finishing my letter at last. Send me newspapers, etc., etc. Enable me to follow the current crisis in Greece. Send me whatever printed matter illuminates it. What's going on in Athens? What in the provinces? In the chasm of evil, does the hope of deliverance exist? It does exist, it does, because Greece, in us, is alive and flourishing. Cousin Zex's work remains as important in the current troubled times as it has ever been. And through his work, as Vienna and Berlin, and Berlin did through Marlowe's, Greece will indeed remain alive and flourishing. Thank you.